Welcome everyone. I'm Jordana Gessler, Vice President of Education and Exhibits at Holocaust Museum LA, the first and oldest Holocaust museum in the United States founded by Holocaust survivors. We were founded in 1961 by a group of survivors who wanted to create a safe place to display their precious artifacts, to remember their family members and loved ones who perished, and educate future generations. Today, the museum continues to provide Holocaust education to students from across Los Angeles, the United States, and the world, fulfilling the mission of our founders to commemorate, educate, and inspire. Thank you so much for joining us for today's program, an intergenerational conversation with Judge Francis Rothschild, a hidden child. Before we get started, please note that we will have some time at the end of the program for questions. You can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Presiding Justice of Division I of the Court of Appeals, Frances Rothschild was hidden by a Catholic family during the Holocaust, ultimately saving her life. Joining us for a conversation is Judge Rothschild, her daughter, and her preteen granddaughter, where we'll talk about how her story has impacted and shaped their family. We're very fortunate to have the three of them with us today. As Judith Kestenberg, child psychiatrist and founder of the International Study of Organized um, Persecution once wrote, by interviewing others, children of survivors may feel vicariously closer to understanding their own parents. And I think this is true of all generations and important to keep in mind as we listen to the stories today. Frances Rothschild is the presiding justice of division one of the Court of Appeals in the second appellate district. She graduated from UCLA majoring in economics and went on to UCLA Law School where she graduated with honors. She is married and has four children and five grandchildren. She has a long history of public service and has also served to the community as a member of the Board of Directors of Vista Del Mar Child and Family Services. She's been honored by the Los Angeles City Council and the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors for outstanding service. She's an educator, author, and editorial consultant for legal treaties. As a member of both the United States Special Commission and a California Gubernatorial Task Force, she worked with various legal and judicial committees. On the Court of Appeal, she has authored decisions on a broad range of legal issues and has continued her judicial committee work and involvement with judicial education. Her daughter, Erica Rothschild, is a writer and producer of film and television with a particular interest in content for kids and young adults. She is currently show running an animated series for Disney called Eureka, set to premiere this November, as well as a, a writing a young adult movie series for Netflix. She's a co-founder of the progressive fundraising group, Persist Happy Hour. Cleo, Justice Rothschild's granddaughter, is 12 years old and a distinguished student in her sixth grade class. Cleo loves writing, as we'll learn more about tonight. She plays soccer in Dungeons and Dragons. She accompanies her father on guitar and ukulele. She bakes sews and has her own business making and selling jewelry. All this and also studying for her bat mitzvah. It is my great pleasure to now introduce Judge Francis Rothschild. Hello, everyone. Excuse me. <clears throat> Anna, you can see me. I wish I could see you uh, to see what you're like and know what you're interested in. But by signing up for this, you have an interest in what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust and perhaps to others also. And I don't know how much history you know, so I'm just going to tell you just a very short history to put what happened to me in its place, in a historical place. So on August 23rd, 1939, the Germans and Russians signed a non-aggressive agreement called the Molotov-Rippentrop Pact, agreeing to divide Poland between them, the Germans to take Western Poland and the Russian Eastern Poland. The Germans invaded Poland on September 1, officially starting World War II. They quickly overwhelmed the Polish forces. A few weeks later, the Russians occupied Eastern Poland. Nearly two years later, in June 1941, the Germans broke the pact and invaded Eastern Poland and Russia. On July 1, they occupied Zlocha, my hometown. I was one month old. Between 1939 and 1944, the Germans and their henchmen dehumanized and slaughtered over 3 million Jews of Poland alone. And altogether during the period, some 6 million in total. Of the 12,000 or so Jews in Slotchow, 
no more than 200 survived and only four children are known to have survived. My cousin, myself, another child that I don't know where she is, and Roald Hoffman, who possibly some of you may have heard of, who won the 1981 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. What follows is a story of daring and bravery, of cunning and kindness repaid, a story of righteous deeds, and yes, of love, written by my granddaughter Cleo, as told to her by me. Cleo? And the details, the de can you hear me? Perhaps speak a little bit closer to the mic on your okay. computer. Um, and the details are correct, and it's kind of my rendition of it. So here it is. I was born in 1941 when being Jewish was paralyzed. This was because Germany had occupied my home country, Poland and the German government was trying to kill all the Jews. My family, along with the other Jews in our town, Blacha, in eastern Poland, close to Lviv, what, in what is now Ukraine, were restricted to a ghetto. Shortly after I was born, Jews who were healthy enough to work, including my mother, father, and grandmother, were sent to a local work camp. No children were allowed in the work camp, and if any were found, the Nazis would kill them, the whole family. Even so, my parents had no choice but to take me with them to the camp. In the camp, there was not a single smile among the Jews. It was as if smiles didn't exist. As soon as we got there, my mother and grandmother were sent to work in the kitchen that fed the camp's population. My father, who had no useful camp skill, was at high risk. Fortunately, he had owned a lumber yard before the war. He was a very kind man, and if someone didn't have quite enough money to buy the wood, he would give it to them on credit. His kindness may have saved his life. A few of the Christian men he used to work with were also working in the camp. They told my father to claim he was a carpenter and they would teach him how to work with wood. This made it safer for him to work at the camp, but nothing would make it safe enough. My mother was hiding me in the kitchens where she worked, hoping no one would hear me. After all, I was a baby and sometimes cried. The camp director who had come to check in often had taken a liking to my mother because she was quite pretty. After she had worked in the camp for a while, the director secretly told my mother that someone had reported seeing a baby and he would have to kill it. He told her to get the baby out of the camp right away. My mother, who was an exceptionally clever woman, had heard my father talking about the men he worked with, one of whom was a Christian farmer. The man had a widowed sister who had no children of her own. My mother hoped that this woman would take me in, so she arranged a secret meeting with the woman. The woman, Natalka, agreed to take me. This was extremely dangerous because if the Germans detected me, she would be killed too. I had red hair, and back then, almost all of the redheads in Poland were Jewish, which made it more likely that Natalka would be caught. Later that year, the director came again to my mother to tell her that the camp was going to be liquidated. This meant that my mother, father, and grandmother would, would either be killed immediately or sent to an extermination camp. Again, my mother thought of a plan requiring the kindness of the men that my father worked with. She had met them all, and one in particular seemed very sympathetic. She arranged a secret meeting with him, and in the end, he agreed to take them in. That man was the father of the Haremko family. They were, Christian and who owned, they were Christians who owned a farm. When the time came, my mother, father, and grandmother escaped to the Haremko's farm. They and another family all came together and dug a large hole under the barn in which to stay. It was only about the size of a large closet. My family lay huddled together with only a blanket between them and the cold ground. But the other choice was much, much worse. The kind Haremkos would feed the group every day a bucket of soup and bread. It was my grandmother's job to divide the food equally, but my mother would often say she was not hungry so that my father could get more food. One day, my father searched in the woods because he had heard that there were some Jewish families hiding there. He hoped he would find my aunt, uncle, and cousin, and he found them, and the grandmother, famished and licking dew off of leaves for water and eating raw stolen potatoes. They were with another family who also had no food. The other family had one child as well. The other family threatened that if my father didn't take their family with them 
to the Haremko's farm, they would turn the Haremko's into the Nazis. But there was no way the Haremko's would take seven more Jews. That night, my father came back alone. When he told my mother what had happened, she yet again came up with a plan. My father would tell the other family that they would only take the child because that was all that the Haremko's had agreed to. This would ensure that the family didn't turn them in because if they did, their child would be killed too. The plan succeeded. Now the Haremkos were housing and feeding three families. Soon after, both the Haremkos children went, ran away from home because they were afraid their family would be discovered housing Jews. Even though my family caused their children to flee, the Haremkos continued to hide. In 1944, the Russians drove out Germans and retook the town. My parents came out of hiding. I can only imagine what it would have been like stepping out into the sunlight after three long years in the bunker. They could once again enjoy the sun blazing down upon their backs, a smile unknown of to the muscles of their mouth, and the odd sensation of being purely filled with warmth, happiness. And for this next part, I just want to say this might not have actually been what happened, but I, it might have been something, and I imagine it to be something like this. I remember the day that it happened. A hard knock on the door interrupted Natalka reading me a bedtime story. We went downstairs and opened the door. I remember Natalka's face. Her eyes went wide and a horrified look clouded her. It was like nothing was inside of her. The three of me looked through the doorway. There stood a man with a nose just like mine, a woman with eyes just like mine, and an old lady with hair just like mine. I asked Natalka what was wrong. To me, it only appeared to be some neighbors coming to say hello. But Natalka didn't seem to think that. B -b but how are you alive? Natalka stammered. We were hidden, answered the woman sharply. Well, why are you here? Natalka asked in a very unconvincing tone. For our daughter, of course, said the woman. I stood there as still as the moment. Surely they couldn't be talking about me, I thought. She's no longer your daughter. I hope you realize that I took her in when she was only a baby. You gave her to me, said Natalka. What are they talking about? I don't even know these people, I thought to myself. Oh, I'm so sorry, but you knew we were always coming back for her right after the war ended, the man said. Well, she's not yours. I am her mother now, said Natalka. Again, my, my real mother with her clever plan. She knew that Natalka was very religious. The next day, Natalka walked me to church where she took me every Sunday. When we got there, my mother told the priest about our situation. After my mother, my mother finished talking, Natalka told the priest that she should be able to keep me. In the end, the priest decided that my biological parents should take me. I wanted to stay with Natalka. She was my mother. I didn't want to go with these strangers who knocked on my door a day before. I felt the strangers tug on my shirt. My heart was beating hard in my chest. I felt warm drops of water stream down my cheeks. No, I yelled. Eventually, my parents got me to come with them. I started to realize that they were my family and they had given me to Natalka to protect me. I understood that after a while and I came to love them. I will always miss Natalka though. After all, she saved my life. Thank you, Cleo. You told my story so well. That was amazing, Cleo. Thank you for sharing that. You know, Fran, how does it feel to hear your, your granddaughter share your story in her own words? Well, I'm so proud of her that she, both using her imagination and the fact that I gave her, she presented something with the content and the emotion uh, of, of those times. And, you know, as a child Holocaust survivor and somebody who experienced the Holocaust in hiding, unaware of your own Jewish identity, what was your life like after the Holocaust? Well, after my parents got me back, uh, strange as it may seem, we made our way to Germany to uh, the, uh, the Allies uh, part of Germany that had occupied, and we were in a displaced persons camp. Uh, I think children adapt. Obviously, I adapted even what I had gone through. And in a way, 
I had it easier than many other children because even though I was in hiding, except for the time I was with my parents at the work camp, I was in hiding in the open. And I had a loving mother like Natalka. And after the war, there were so few children as you see from my hometown. I told you there's only four. Uh, I received a lot of love from everybody that adults that had survived to be so happy that they're still a child. Um, so that was let's see, 44. So we were in Germany for three, for four years almost, awaiting the quota to come to the United States. And I would say those were happy years because my parents had the leisure. They weren't working to spend time with me and they wanted to spend a lot of time with me. The difficult times actually came when we came to the United States. Um, how did you go from being raised as a Catholic girl to being introduced to Judaism? Well, let's, my parents were not, were not religious, but my grandmother who always lived with us, the same grandmother that survived in hiding with my parents uh, was, but they each kept to their own ideas. So my parents were not synagogue going. My grandmother was. My parents did was were not kosher, but my grandmother kept a kosher home. My parents were not religious, but we celebrated all the high holidays, the traditions, you know, Hanukkah, Passover, um, other holidays together. My parents didn't go to synagogue, but when we moved to a small town in New Jersey. I walked my grandmother every Saturday, uh, the, the two and a half or three mile distance each way to go to a little one room synagogue uh, in the country. So I was very much exposed to it. Now I didn't go to Hebrew school, but my parents believed in the tradition. So I went to what was called Yiddish school and I learned to read and write Yiddish at home, in fact, that was the language uh, that we spoke to each other at home. Nonetheless, I had no trouble learning English. And I think you can tell I actually don't have an accent, though many young people who were Holocaust survivors and just were a little bit older, not much older, uh, do have accents, but I adopted or adapted very quickly to the language. And for people joining us today um, who may or may not know this, the, there was a period after the Holocaust where traditionally in society, people were not open to hearing stories of the Holocaust. People didn't want to share or were afraid to share. And this was particularly true in the United States. And it really wasn't until um, there was a mini series called the Holocaust in the 1970s featuring Meryl Streep. And that's in which the time that stories started to be shared. And I'm wondering if you had that experience, did your parents, did your grandmother, were they sharing their experiences during the Holocaust with you? Um, did they share it with other people to your knowledge? When did you start talking about your experience? Well, I think everybody thinks they're individual, but actually this was very typical, as you say. The only way I know anything about the experiences in the Holocaust is from the snippets I heard from either other people, not my parents, but relatives or heard them talking to their intimate friends. Never did they directly ever tell me about anything that had happened. And indeed, until now, I've stayed away from it myself. Um, and, and preparing you know, myself for this and preparing for talking to Cleo, I had to talk to my cousins <clears throat> and to my sister and brother, I read a chapter of a book called The Hidden Children written by my cousin. 
I went to the writings of Raoul Hoffman, who I just mentioned, who was also from my hometown and a little bit older than I and survived to put together the story, at least the historical story, the details of the individual events that happened to us, I knew. And I think one of the reasons I knew them is I'm sure you can tell from the story that my mother was the very clever, smart one who would never give up. My father was the more philosophical type who had a very strong moral sense. And I would, he and there are other events other than uh, saving my aunt and uncle and cousins that he performed during the war. And I heard others talking about it, about his bravery and the things he had done. So that's where I learned about it. So it's almost as if you had to be an investigator for your own family history of I putting did. these pieces together. And you're right, this isn't an individual or unique experience. This was very much a, a generalization that after the Holocaust, there was this desire for people to somehow return to normalcy or begin a new life in America, or for those who had immigrated to Israel, begin a new life in Israel and sort of move forward and even the community here in the United States, whether Jewish or not Jewish, wasn't that interested at the time in learning more. I mean, even our understanding of post-traumatic -tra stress disorder, or PTSD, didn't really develop until after Vietnam. And so there really were these years of silence. Um, and it sounds like you really had to sort of work to put together your family history. And I guess my question is what changed? What inspired you to want to put together this information to be able to share these stories? Was there one moment that inspired you or was it an, an evolution over time? I think it was when Cleo asked me about it and I realized that it was important that she know about it. And then I started to think, well, maybe it's important for others to know about it. I'm a very private person. So I've never spoken about it to my friends. I think some of my friends who will be listening to this, even close friends, I think will be surprised with what they've heard. Um, and I guess Erica, for you, um, first of all, being a professional storyteller um, in your line of work, how, how is it hearing your daughter share both the historical facts and her perception of what she believes her grandmother experienced, um, especially as somebody who grew up um, maybe not hearing these stories, but it being ever present. Uh, well, I have many different reactions to her story. The professional in me is incredibly impressed in how uh, evocative and specific and moving the writing is at 12. Um, the, the mom in me is very proud <laughs> and the daughter of, or the, a member of a family who survived the Holocaust. Um, I, I'm happy that my mother is opening up about this to my daughter because I think that it is a healthy thing for her to do. And I think that it is a good experience for Cleo to understand in, in her place in the world excuse me, that, well, we are so lucky and our lives are so calm and relatively easy right now. Her own family um, went through so much suffering and so much discrimination. And I think that is the, the first bridge in real empathy is when you can relate to what your mother, your grandmother, your sister, your brother went to went through it is a bridge to relating to the rest of the world as well and understanding that you know the things that are being done to people today could be done to you and your family as well. Um, and hopefully if this generation understands that lesson, you know we can move forward in a kinder way in the future. 
And we're talking a lot about generations and another trend that was common during um, when we're looking at Holocaust survivors sharing their experiences is the trend we talked about where grandchildren begin asking their grandparents about what life was like when they were a kid, where they came from, uh, maybe if they were born in a different country, why they moved here. And Erica, for you to have had a set of grandparents who also survived the Holocaust, did that ever take place? Was there ever a moment that you asked them about their experiences or they started to share them with you? They really did not talk about their experiences um, in my memory. My uncle, Ralph, who I believe is um, in the participation group today, my, my first understanding probably came from him because he was the first historian in our family who really interrogated the, these questions. Um, and I remember snippets of my grandmother telling stories that would just come out um, complete non sequiturs you know, at dinner, and then it would just be gone immediately. Um, but about 15 years ago, my uncle Ralph and my mother's sister, Edie as well, went back to what is now Ukraine, what was then Eastern Poland with my grandparents. And at that point, they really did start to open up and tell their stories to us. And, and maybe they told their stories to other people before them, but it was my first experience of hearing them divulge what had happened to them. What a tremendous experience to be able to visit the place where your mother and your grandparents were from um, and hear more of those, those stories firsthand. And Cleo, I guess my question for you is what inspired you to want to write about your grandmother's story? And both Erica and Cleo, I'm gonna ask you guys since you're sharing a mic, when you're the one speaking, get a little bit closer, you know, roll the other one out of the way. Um, so for, so I always really know like about it, but I didn't know the details and for school, I had an, a family story thing assignment. And at first I was going to do uh, something on my dad's side, but then I realized that this was just like an amazing story and I could tell this. And so then I asked my grandmother about it and we had an interview and wrote, wrote the story. Wonderful. And um, I, you know, one of the questions that I saw come in from the audience, and as a reminder, you can ask questions in the Q&A chat box, was about Steven Spielberg and the 1990s. And it is um, true. I mean, as we mentioned earlier, there were many years of silence, generally speaking, following the Holocaust on behalf of Holocaust survivors. And there were some little piece moments of opening. So as I mentioned in the US in the 1970s when Meryl Streep um, was in that miniseries, and then a little bit earlier than that in Israel during the Eichmann trial when so many people were listening to that on radio and Holocaust survivors were invited to give their testimony at the trial, um, which is different than at the Nuremberg trials where survivor testimony was not included. So to have so many survivors stand and speak on a televised um, broadcasted moment, that was another opening. But really, one of the largest openings in which survivors felt space and support in sharing their experience was in the 1990s following Schindler's List. Um, and this goes back to being a storyteller and I guess what the responsibility is for people who work in the entertainment industry or, or people who are storytellers professionally, what responsibility they have to tell untold stories. Um, and having a famous director like Steven Spielberg, who had just sort of, I think, worked on Indiana Jones, gives space to the story of the Holocaust, um, invited many survivors to begin coming forward. Uh, simultaneously, this was also a moment, I think we, we heard about this from Fran, who said it wasn't until her grandchild came to her and started asking questions, or Erica, who returned back to what is now the Ukraine with her family, um, in the 1990s, that's when many Holocaust survivors were grandparents. If you think generation, generationally how, where they landed, and that's when grandchildren started to ask. And so um, what ended up happening is so many survivors wanted to share their stories and began contacting Steven Spielberg and you know, different media outlets. And that's where the impetus for 
what we now know as the Shoah Foundation housed at um, USC here in Los Angeles. That's really what began this process of recording what is now over 50,000 different survivor testimonies from across the globe in over 30 different languages. But not all survivors spoke at that time. And I guess, friend, did, did you give testimony to the Shoah Foundation in the 90s? No. Yeah, it, I mean, and that's also true. Even though they were able to collect over 50,000 testimonies, I can share I'm also the grandchild of Holocaust survivors who did not give testimony um, at that time. So I think moments like this are so important moments in which we have Cleos and which we have participants like our audience today who are interested in hearing these stories and telling them. Um, that's such an important aspect of our work that we still must continue to do despite all of the work that's been done before. Um, so I, I, I have a few more questions and then we'll take some more from the audience. And, you know, Fran, we heard that your daughter and your family returned back to your hometown. Was it a choice of yours that you did not want to return there? Have you been back since? It was my choice and, and I have not, and I don't have an interest in doing that. I think to me, all I know is about the horrors but my parents, of course, this was their homeland in which they spent the best years of their lives. After the war, they were broken people. They've really never recovered. But they, between 1913 when they were born and 1939 or maybe take 41, whichever, those were the best years of their lives there as, as teenage, as young people growing up. Uh, the towns that they lived in, they didn't come from the same town. They were not like Fiddler on the Roof. These were in shtetls. Not every Jew lived like Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, there were plenty of merchant families in, in Poland, and both my sides of the family were, and, and they had a wonderful life. Um, and in a moment, all that was gone, and it, it they never, re they never recovered emotionally. And Erica, when you're so many of their relatives, my father, my father's father, and his brother were killed. My mother's mother, her father, her two brothers, not to speak of cousins and aunts and uncles. And Erica, would you say that's how the experience you understood it when you traveled back there? Did you hear memories of this pre-Holocaust life or was it mostly stories from the Holocaust? Uh, absolutely, there were both. Um, we went, when we went to my grandmother's town, she absolutely got nostalgic about her life before the war. Um, she was from a prominent family. The house she grew up in is now City Hall. It's the biggest house in town and she was very proud of that. Um, she showed us the places where she would play as a child, and it, it was a moment of feeling the fanciness and importance and hope of youth that she obviously did not get to live out for the rest of her life. So we, I'm going to take some um, questions from the audience. We have a question for you, Fran. Why do you think you chose not to share this story during your life with your friends? Or was it, I guess, a conscious decision not to share? Well, how can I answer that? It's just something that, I don't know, was too painful. It seemed too private. It's, it was too hard. It's too much of a horror, it seemed to me, to share with anyone. I have an, uh, an answer for that as well. Um, or a, a theory. Um, my mother is very grateful and positive. She doesn't talk about it, and I don't even think she knows it consciously, but she doesn't like to dwell on the hardships and the suffering and feel sorry for herself. I think she knows she worked hard and is smart, but also feels lucky in so many ways to have the life that she has now. And doesn't want to dwell on the, the hardship in a way that would make that would pose her as a victim because I don't think she feels that way about herself at all. 
Graham, what do you think about that? I think that's a good that's a good explanation that I suppose I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. Erica, when do you think you were first aware of the Holocaust or that it had impacted your family? You know, I had this question ahead of time and I still don't have an answer. Um, I'm sure as a, you know, by the time I was Cleo's age, I was aware that the Holocaust existed and that my family participated in it as survived it, probably a better verb for it. Um, but I don't remember a certain moment when I had to. Uh, I kind of have something to that. Um, so I had heard stories about like, about when they were in the United States. And I always thought that's when they were in Poland because I didn't know that my grandma moved to the US so young. I thought she grew up in Poland for a long time. And then I heard about, you know, well, I knew about the Holocaust, but I didn't know about how it like, how it impacted her. And then I realized, and she told me the story, and I realized that she didn't really grow up as much in, well, like, in, on a farm in Poland with her family, but like with the Taliban in the United States. And Cleo, is this a story that you've shared with other people, like friends or your school? Well, for school, like we had peer revising, and so some of my classmates obviously read it, and my teacher. And I, I guess I, I don't really know if I shared it more than that, but like, yeah, my teacher and friends, the people that were by in school. And I think you know everything that the three of you are saying is very much, it's it's not an independent experience. You know, Eric, I asked you that question about when did you first know about the Holocaust? And it's funny because I've asked my own father that question and he'll say he was born knowing about it. It just existed always sort of in the air. And it's always interesting how as generations we pass down experiences, how to be resistant, how to be, str how to be strong, um, and then also what sort of the, the discomfort we've had or the horrors we've been through. And I know for you, Fran, it, it was very unique for you to experience warmth and love from someone who you didn't know was not your biological mother. And I'm wondering if you were able to ever reunite with her or contact her um, or, or correspond with her at all after 1945. Well, we maintained relationships with all the people that had helped us. And I didn't mention all of them. There were uh, uh, at least one other family who, while my parents still were in the ghetto, when there would be a search for children, our, one of our neighbors, Mrs. Nimchitsky, Nimchitska, it's a woman, Nimchitska, uh, would take me to her parents' farm and hide me. Anyway, we kept in touch. We helped her immigrate to the United States with her daughter. We kept in touch with and financially supported uh, both Natalka and also the Naremkos and their grandchildren. Um, in fact, there's a story that Cleo loves called the pig that saved Natalka. So I won't tell it to you, but other than to say that my family, as the Russians moved east, Poles moved west. I'm going to tell you about this area, which is now the Ukraine. It was pretty much evenly divided between Jews, Poles, and Ukrainians. And, um, so she let Natalka did not want to stay in what would be uh, the Russian zone. Of course, it turned out Poland was a satellite. It was a Russian zone anyway, but she moved from there. My parents helped her obtain a farm farther west where German um, were escaping to Germany out of who had lived in the areas that were Poland. Uh, so we kept in touch with them constantly and it just, Happenstance, I had a housekeeper 
who was a Amer Polish American and she could read and write Polish. So she used to write to Natalka for me and Natalka would write back and she would interpret for us. And um, which did, were they ever recognized by Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations? You know, I really am not sure. Am I? I think my parents may have, but I, I'm not sure. For those in the audience who aren't familiar, um, Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem in Israel, which actually initially was established in the 1950s, um, they have an entire department called Righteous Among the Nations, which searches for names of non-Jews who rescued Jews during the Holocaust at no privilege or gain to themselves, and they honor them. And it's called um, being a righteous Gentile or righteous among the nations. And they have, they have over 20,000 names of individuals who, who acted um, during the Holocaust and, and rescued people's lives. Um, so, um, Eddie says the answer is yes, they were recognized by Yad Vashem. So thank you so much, Eddie, for sharing that. Um, if any of you ever visit Jerusalem, you can actually go to Yad Vashem and every name of every person who rescued is etched into a stone memorial wall and you can honor them in that way. So. Um, some of my final questions that I have for the three of you is, you know, what's next in the storytelling and the family sharing? Where do you see this going? Is this something that you want to, and I guess, Cleo, this is for you. Is this something that you would want to research more of? Do you f feel that you have all of the stories? Um, wh what would you like to um, do with this story next, if anything? Well, I, I know I'm still, I, okay, I'll speak up. I know I'm still interested in these stories, and I certainly don't know all of it. And I would like to pass it on. Like I know my sister doesn't know as much about it as I know, so I tell it to her, and my grandma would tell it to her, and you know, future generations too. Um, and Eric, I guess the same question for you: What do you see as next? Would you? consider going back to Europe, would you want to do more research about this? Um, if my mother wanted to go back to Ukraine, I would happily take her. Um, I think the trip I took with Edie and Ralph, my aunt and uncle, probably a one-of-a-kind experience that can't really be replicated, especially because my grandparents aren't alive any longer. That was so remarkable about it, getting to do that. Um, I'm glad that our family is sharing the stories now, and I certainly hope we continue to do that and share them with our next generation as well. Fran, what about you? What do you think is next for your story? Where do you hope it goes, or do you have a vision of what you would want to do next? Well, As I said before, this has been very hard for me, and I'm not sure that I can contribute anymore along these lines. So where I can contribute is what I do best, which is to be the best judge that I can and to make sure that justice is done in, in every case, and I'm vigilant about that. And those are my goals. I think those are excellent goals. How, and I'm opening up the Q&A if anyone has any sort of final questions. Um, but I guess the other question I have for him is, how has your experience, do you think, impacted you or inspired you, if it has, in your opinion? I mean, you've had this incredible career um, and probably at a time when there may have been fewer female attorneys and judges. Um, how do you think you've been shaped in your career and in your personal life by your experiences? Well, I, I think I learned a lot from my parents in this sense, kind of never to give up because that was always the sense I had from them as to, even though I didn't know exactly what happened sometimes, but I heard, as I say, these snippets and each one of them was, first of all, a moral lesson, uh, just as an example 
about my father, just to give you the idea of what kind of moral lessons he could give a child. My brother who went with Erica, my sister, and my parents back to Zlocho, they went to a castle. In that castle, 2,000 Jews had either been shot or buried alive, including my grandfather and my father's brother and my mother's brother. And maybe Erica will remember this, but I just saw my brother recently for a birthday celebration. And he said, when they started talking about the 2000 Jews that had been killed on that spat, spot, their killing went on from early morning to late in the night. He said, but don't re forget that only a few days earlier, the Soviets had shot almost a thousand men in these pits as well. So the moral lesson from him in that little bit is that even though he had suffered so much and he had been there too and almost been killed, that's another story, uh, but escaped, he could think of the other person. Well, this is a lesson more than any story about suffering could teach you. That's an Erica, do you remember yeah. that? I don't remember that moment specifically, but uh, I know there are countless moments from my grandfather, your father's life, before the war and during the war and up until the end of his life in which he was spectacularly empathetic, um, especially considering the positions that he was in, where he could have easily just thought of himself, but always himself in somebody else's shoes, and always could think of. It, it didn't focus on his own suffering, but what was happening to others. Um, and even on this trip, I mean, this is a lighter end. We had a, um, a day or two, Ralph may remember this better than I can, with a rabbi in Ukraine who was, I use the term rabbi like, not nice and incredibly misogynistic and sexist. And I was in my 20s and I, you know, didn't take to it well and I was very vocal about it. And my grandfather, who was, you know, in his 70s then, became a feminist for me over that trip. Um, and he just opened up his vast resources of empathy for yet another group. And it was really um, heartening to watch. So what I learned from many of these stories is not only that my family was so lucky, but from these snippets I heard that in many situation, people help my father because of his own humanity. That they were affected by it. And though, of course, all credit goes to them, but he was that kind of sympathetic person that if you were the kind that wanted to help someone, he would be the one you would want to help. Is that your impression, Erica? Absolutely. It's a full life that I knew him and all of the stories I heard about him. And Cleo, as someone who you haven't heard, um, or I guess you haven't met, but what do you think your impression, what did you learn from your grandmother's story? Um, how, how do you think it shaped you? So I, so like in the story where my great grandfather was really nice and kind to all the men that helped him and made it safer for him to be in the work camp and how clever um, my great grandmother was, it taught me that like, that if, if you are kind to other people, you'll most likely be rewarded. And it was the combination of 
deep, deep kindness. And as my mom said, humanity in my grandfather and brilliant cunningness in my grandmother. And of course, luck. Not to make little of my mother, but my father had enough empathy for others and kindness to others to take to take care of everybody. Uh, and my mother, as I think said, was extremely clever and she was very, very cunning and practical, as you can tell from the story in each situation. My father's kindness was the background, but it her, was her ability to negotiate the situation, assess it and act upon it that saved them and us. I think there's no better note that I could think of ending on than Cleo's words about being a good person and really at the heart of this story and experience when there's so many examples of the capacity of human beings to do horrific things to one another. I mean, just the one story of the Einsatzgruppen units, the German mobile units that were just shooting Jews um, in totality but for us to find this glimmer of hope that people can be extremely empathetic, people can be extremely kind, despite and in spite of these horrific events. And that kindness grows like a ripple. There then leads to more kind actions for one another and really building a more dignified space. So teaching kindness, I think, is just such a wonderful place to find a closing to this evening. Um, I want to thank the three of you so much for sharing, Cleo, for writing this beautiful story really both you know from historically researched and then from a creative perspective of the different characters of the story how it must have felt for each of those three women or the two women and the one child in this reunion um, that was bittersweet and challenging I'm sure for everyone involved and your maturity and your understanding of it is really incredible and Erica thank you so much for allowing us to speak with your daughter and for sharing your perspective as both a daughter and a mother, um, as somebody who's traveled to these places and somebody who's the bridge between the past and the future. And Fran, as someone who mentions herself that you don't often share these stories, thank you for entrusting us with them, um, for letting us hear it and for letting us learn more about your experience in order for us to think critically about the world around us and really start to envision how do we wanna change the present and the future. So on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA, thank you, the three of you, for sharing your time, your story. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us, for listening, for considering, for contemplating the different important moments and conversations that I think we've had. I think there's a lot to digest and a lot to share um, with our friends and our own families. Before we sign off, I want to invite everyone to join us this Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific for a conversation with acclaimed artist, Jack Boole, whose work was inspired by what he witnessed as a young soldier in a post-war Europe. You can join us on Thursday at 11 a.m. for our weekly Holocaust survivor talk. This week, we'll hear from survivor Ruth, whose family fled Germany after Kristallnacht, and she was a hidden child in the Netherlands. She will share her story of survival. You can find more information about all of our virtual events on our website, holocaustmuseumla.org, also, a recording of this program will be available on Holocaust Museum LA's YouTube channel tomorrow, um, where you can also see some of our previous programs as well. Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's at no charge. If you are enjoying our programs, please consider supporting our work by becoming a member and learning more insider tips um, about the museum and its programs. Thank you again for this wonderful family and for all of you for joining us today. Take care and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.